All right, welcome back to Chapter 5's brief overview and discussion. Uh, last video, we discussed monomers and polymers and how uh, the, the macromolecules of life are typically big polymers. We discussed some of the details of carbohydrates and lipids. And now we're going to move into proteins and nucleic acids. I should say that as the course progresses, we're going to discuss the roles of these molecules more in the context of what they do. Uh, very soon, in fact, we're going to talk about a certain group of proteins known as enzymes and how they're crucial, really, for life to exist as we know it. Uh, and then a little later on, we will discuss nucleic acids like DNA and RNA and how they work together to basically code for all the information that living things need to, to exist and, and how that information is used to form products, which is maybe one of, I think it's the most phenomenal thing in all of biology, one of my favorite things that, that we learn together. Uh, so yeah, so that'll be down the pipe as well. So going back to here to where we left off. Did I share my screen? Don't know if I shared my screen. I did not. Now that, I've done that before, where I went through a whole video, uh, recorded a whole video without sharing my screen, and here I am talking about the slides that nobody else is seeing. That was frustrating. <laughs> All right, so now I think you're seeing where we left off. Um, guys, proteins, super diverse group of of macromolecules. I mean, there were lots of different examples of, of lipids and some different examples of carbohydrates. Proteins might be the most diverse group, excuse me, of the big four. Um, you can see even just from this slide right here, structure, transport, cell communication. Um, they, they participate in our immune system, uh, catalyzing chemical reactions in the case of enzymes, so many different types of proteins. And here's a nice summarizing table of, of just that, different functions and examples. We're going to talk a lot more about enzymes in Chapter 8. Um, so, you know, this is just sort of be a basic rundown on, on what enzymes are. But these are proteins that catalyze or speed up chemical reactions. And what I think is pretty phenomenal is it's they're very specific. So each enzyme only catalyzes... Uh, typically a single type of chemical reaction, and it's all because of molecular shape. So shape and function is one of the huge themes of biology that's gonna come up several times throughout the year. So because of the shape of the enzyme, the reactants or the substrate, substrates fit, molecularly fit, like lock and key, but even way more intricate and specific into the enzyme. And because they're brought together in a certain way, Bonds can be broken and reformed much more easily. We're talking millions of times faster in, in many cases. So enzymes are, you could argue without enzymes, life could not exist. And so here's this little purple example of an enzyme. Uh, right here, the place where the substrate fits into the enzyme is known as the active site of the enzyme. Once it's in there, turns out a hydro or excuse me, yeah, hydrolysis reaction occurs and we break these monomers apart back into their individual monomers. So when we learned about condensation reactions and hydrolysis reactions, oftentimes those are sped up uh, by different enzymes in our bodies. So just like with carbohydrates, you think saccharide. With proteins, think peptide. So there's dipeptides, polypeptides. Um, a protein and a polypeptide are the same thing. Uh, and the monomers of proteins are amino acids. So we typically don't call them monopeptides. Uh, for some reason, we just call them peptides. So an amino acid is a peptide. And when you link a bunch of them together, you get a polypeptide, aka a protein. Living cells, as far as we know, typically use 20 different amino acids. There's a lot more than 20, but for whatever reason, living cells tend to only use 20 of all the amino acids that are out there, with some exceptions. Some use 19, some use 21. 
but for us in most organisms, it's 20. So again, amino acids are the monomers. And here's the basic structure of an amino acid. You can see that every one of them has a central carbon connected to a hydrogen. An amino group on one side, a carboxylic acid group on the other, and then there's this R group. So R, imagine we're in algebra. R stands for something. There's no element R there. R could be another hydrogen only, and that would be the simplest, smallest amino acid. It could be a CH3 group. It could be a huge carbon chain or carbon ring or who knows what could be attached there. But whatever gets plugged in at this R spot is what makes one amino acid different from another. One paper clip different from the other 19 paper clips. So this is good to, to know and be able to visually recognize. Here's a chart of all the different amino acids and you can see highlighted in white uh, is, is what's plugged into that R spot. Notice the whole rest of the molecule, the amino acid molecule is the same in every case. Now some of these R groups are nonpolar. Some of them are polar, some of them are acidic, basic, charged, uncharged. So this is going to, I think, obviously affect when you link a bunch of these together in different orders, affect the overall structure of the protein. Like charges repel, opposite charges attract, polar and nonpolar do not interact, whereas nonpolar and nonpolar do, for instance. So you have all of those interactions occurring within your chain of amino acids. The bonds between two separate amino acids are known as peptide bonds. Again, we link them together through condensation or dehydration reactions. When you link hundreds of thousands of amino acids together in a chain, because of all those reactions or all those uh, associations between the amino acids, attractions and repulsions, you're going to wind up getting a very complex three-dimensional shape, sometimes referred to as a globular three-dimensional shape. So we talk about levels of protein structure, and the structure determines the function. Well, this, this is trying to show you a little bit of the specific interaction between a protein uh, and a molecule that it would interact with because of its shape. But here we go, there's four levels of protein structure. Primary structure is just what order the amino acids are in. Secondary structure isn't talked about a whole lot. It's, uh, we talk about coils of the chain, maybe what's called a, a beta pleated sheet of, of the chain. Um, again, doesn't get a whole lot of, of discussion, but tertiary structure, tertiary is the third level. This is probably the most important level of the four because this is how different amino acids interact because of their R groups. And it causes the chain of amino acids to bend and twist and re repulsions to occur and attractions. So you get your super complex, highly convoluted 3D shape of a protein due to its, which represents its tertiary structure. Quaternary structure refers to the fourth level of structure and this is basically when two or more proteins interact to form sort of like a mega protein, if you will. All right, so primary structure, again, basically the order of the amino acids. Secondary structure, we have alpha helices. I refer to the beta pleated sheet. Uh, it's just sort of how the chain can have some, some minor uh, shape change to it. But tertiary structure, this is when you get sort of this unbelievably complex, unique structure that's formed from all the attractions and repulsions within the polypeptide chain. And then if multiple proteins interact here, you see the quaternary structure. One example that we could mention here is uh, the disease condition known as sickle cell anemia. Normally the hemoglobin protein folds up very nice in a, in a nice ball globular shape and thus inside our, well hemoglobin is the protein uh, that, that helps ca carries oxygen inside our red blood cells. 
And when it balls up real nice, the red blood cells have their typical shape. In sickle cell anemia, there is a single genetic mutation that causes one amino acid to be different. In the entire hemoglobin protein, one amino acid is different. And it causes that protein to stick out in, in rod-shaped structures instead of balled-up structures. And so you can see here that what that does to the shape of the red blood cells. They take on a sickle or half moon or quarter moon shape. Without getting into all the details, because we will later in the course, this causes these red blood cells to not carry oxygen as efficiently, to not live as long in circulation, to clog the capillary vessels, which typically are have such small diameters, they only let one red blood cell through at a time, single file. Uh, so people with sickle cell anemia tend to have lots of what they call crises uh, when they get blockages in their circulatory system. And here's a close up of what it does to the shape of a red blood cell. Another very important characteristic of proteins is denaturation, where we can denature a protein. So again, this get, we'll get into this more a little bit in chapter eight, but um, a protein's tertiary structure is reliant on the pH of the solution it's in, the salt concentration, as well as the temperature. All those factors are going to affect the inter and intramolecular uh, con connections between the monomers. When you change the pH, the salt concentration, or the temperature, you can disrupt those interactions and change the shape of the protein, and that's known as denaturing the protein. Typically, protein, well, we just said before, structure is everything. And so a protein only works if its structure is perfect. If you're talking about a lock and key interaction, uh, let's say between an enzyme and its substrate, if I got a file and filed the nubs off the key, that key's not going to work the lock anymore. I changed its shape, it no longer functions. If I shave it off a little, just one of the nubs, well, maybe it'll kind of work, but, but it'll stick. And so maybe that's not death, but maybe disease. Something's not working as well as it should versus totally changing the enzyme shape, denaturing it so it works zero. Well, if that's a crucial function that's no longer happening, that could be death to that cell. So here's a normal protein. I can denature it. Again, I, sorry, the Google Slides did this to all my slides. I didn't, don't know why. Uh, but if I, let's say, heat up this protein, I denature it. Now look at its shape. In some cases, you can change the temperature back to what it was, and it'll reform its original shape. It'll reassemble. Not always, though. Think of heating egg white. It starts out as a clear, gooey liquid. You heat it up, it goes back, it turns into a solid white, semi-solid white uh, substance. Can't go back. You can cool that egg white down and it's going to stay in that new new form. So it's not always freely reversible. Uh, here's something about chaperonins. Um, again, maybe you read about heat shock proteins um, that can help stabilize our proteins, let's say when we get a fever. The whole point of a fever is to raise the temperature, our core temperature, to denature the proteins of the, the pathogen viruses, bacteria, and so forth. Well, just like our, or just like their proteins can be denatured by raising the temperature, so could ours potentially. So heat shock proteins uh, tend to stabilize the protein shape uh, to help us. Now, again, if we have too high of a fever for too long, it can overwhelm that, and that's why having a high fever can be fatal. So throw yourself in a cold tub if your fever is 108 for too long. All right. Last group of organic molecules we'll discuss here are nucleic acids. And guys, we're going to get into way more detail later on about DNA and RNA, which, by the way, the NA stands for nucleic acid. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. And so let's take a look here. The two examples, RNA and DNA, uh, there are some subtle differences between the molecules. Uh, thus, and th thus, their functions are different. 
But here's, here's the process I was alluding to earlier, uh, gene expression. So DNA is a nucleic acid that stores genetic information. mRNA or messenger RNA is sort of the working copy of a gene, right? A gene being a segment of DNA that codes for something, typically protein. This mRNA leaves the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. It meets up with ribosomes, which are made of rRNA or ribosomal RNA. And then amino acids are assembled through condensation reactions uh, in such a way that the gene dictated. And part of this amino acid uh, assemblage is tRNA molecules, transfer RNA molecules. So DNA and RNA are all about storing hereditary information, in the case of DNA, and then expressing those genes or making the products that they code for. It's an, it's an incredible process, it really is. The monomers of nucleic acids are nucleotides. Okay, so polymers are polynucleotides. Um, each nucleotide is made up of three parts. So here's one nucleotide. There is a phosphate group, a nitrogen base, and a pentose sugar. Now, in DNA nucleotides, this sugar is deoxyribose, which is why we named it deoxyribonucleic acid. In RNA nucleotides, this pentose sugar is ribose, which is why RNA is named ribonucleic acid. <clears throat> and here you can see the difference in the two sugars. You might be able to infer that deoxyribose is just like ribose, but deoxy is missing an oxygen. And this diagram does show it. So here, here's an oxygen that's not here in this spot. Now, within DNA nucleotides, the phosphate and the sugar are all the same. And within RNA nucleotides, the phosphate and the sugar are always the same. What makes a nucleotide different from another is what's what type of nitrogen base is plugged in here. So for proteins, there were 20 different amino acids because there was 20 different things you could plug into the R spot on the amino acid. There's only four different nitrogen bases for DNA and four different ones for RNA. Three of the four overlap. The A's, adenine, the T's, excuse me, the G's, guanine, and the C's, cytosine, are common to DNA and RNA. But DNA uses thymine, RNA uses uracil. It's just the way the molecules connect. They're had because of this difference in the sugar, there's a difference in one of the nitrogen bases between DNA and RNA. And typically, so here we have a strand of, nucleic, uh, of nucleotides. When we list the genetic code, we don't bother saying anything about the phosphates and the sugars because they're the same. But we will say A, G, C, T, 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 C, G, A, A. We will just list the nitrogen bases because that's really what matters. That's what varies and makes up the genetic code. You can see here that these are called pyrimidine bases and A's and G's are purines. I always remembered that, uh, that by saying A, G is the symbol for silver, chemical symbol for silver, and silver can be pure. I know that's not great, but it's always how I remembered it. Um, I've had students say that uh, CT, King Tut, pyramids, again, that's not great either, but it works, I guess, maybe. And your cell takes the place of thymine, right, in RNA. So if you remember King Tut, if you can remember C and T or pyrimidines, since U takes the place of T, U is also a pyrimidine. Also notice that py pyrimidines are single ringed nitrogen base, whereas purines are a double ranked nitrogen base. This is going to become important when we form our DNA double helix, and I'll wait for a different diagram to show you why. So purines, pyrimidines, double helix is that twisted ladder that DNA molecules form. Uh, the two strands run in opposite directions, thus they're called anti-parallel. We're going to get into that at a later time as well. But basically, you can see that there's a five prime end to this orangey strand and a three prime end. It's kind of like a beginning and an end to the strand. 
Well, its complementary strand runs in the opposite direction. So if this is five to three this way, this one has to be five to three the opposite way. So the phrase that describes that is that they are anti-parallel. But notice how these bases pair together across the double helix. It's always an A paired with a T and a G with a C. In other words, it's always a double ringed purine with a single ringed pyrimidine. So the double helix is always three rings across, a double and a single, a single and a double, a single and a double. But imagine a ladder. If we were to untwist this helix and make it sort of an upright uh, two-dimensional ladder, imagine if the steps were all different widths, two single rings, two double rings, a single and a double. That would be way unstable. So it works out great that it's always a purine paired with a pyrimidine, A with a T, G with a C. Keep that uniformity in the distance across the double helix. And guys, the little bond between the two bases, at least across from each other, dot, 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 to represent weak attractions. Oh, what could they be? What weak bonds did we talk about that were so important? Hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are like painter's blue tape to me. I don't know if you've ever painted uh, and seen the blue tape that you can sort of mask, you know, window moldings or baseboard moldings with so you don't get paint on them if you're painting the walls. Well, blue tape was created uh, because it's sticky enough to stick while you're painting, but not so sticky that after a day or two when you go to peel it off, it pulls the finish of whatever it was stuck to off with it. And then you got to paint or you got to fix that. So somebody, I don't know if it was 3M or who did it, invented painter's blue tape. Sticky enough to stick, but not so sticky that when you peel it off, it's going to damage what's underneath. To me, that's what hydrogen bonds are. They're blue tape bonds because they're strong enough to keep the two strands together when they need to be held together. But guys, every time we express a gene, we have to break the hydrogen bonds. Every time we copy the DNA, we have to break the hydrogen bonds. So if they were super strong covalent linkages, that would take a lot of time and energy, not as efficient. Blue tape bonds, aka hydrogen bonds, strong enough to hold things together when we need to, not so strong that it takes that much to split them, which we have to do pretty often. Hydrogen bonds, perfect. All right. Guys, here at the end is a nice summarizing table. I'm a big fan of summarizing tables, whether they're from your book or your softback review books, or even better yet, ones that you make for yourself. Um, the act of making it is going to help you to learn and remember the information better. Uh, you're going to organize it, which means your brain is going to organize it better. But at the very least, look at other organizing tables. Here's the big four, carbs, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. Uh, some things about the elements that make them up and their structure, their monomers, um, examples and functions. So this is a real handy thing to have or to make uh, when you go back to look at Chapter 5, not only for the test we have, uh, and, but when it comes time to study for the AP test as well. Because this is September. That test is in May. We're not going to talk about a lot of these details until we start reviewing in April for the test. So it's good to have, really for every topic, uh, summarizing tables, uh, outlines, things like that, that you can refer to. And again, that's why those softback review books aren't just helpful now, but especially leading up to test time. All right. So almost half and half. This one was a teeny bit shorter, but which going to do? Let me find you here. All right, so that is our lightning fast quick review of chapter five. Um, hopefully most of this is stuff you're just nodding your head to saying, yep, yep, knew it, reviewed it all summer, studied it recently. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, hopefully, hopefully this helped. Again, reach out if you have any questions. And I will see you, for, well, either on our Google Meet or on our chapter eight video, which I'm going to shoot now. So whenever you watch it, I'm going to have the same shirt on. Embarrassing? No, I don't think so.